Late Night Thoughts with Mr. Zeppo. Welcome, friends. It's Friday, March 31st. It's 2.02 a.m. in the Pacific Standard Time Zone of the Westiest West Coast. I'm wide awake. Gonna share with you just some wild and silly thoughts uh, that coming at me in the middle of the night um, because I've been up on a bender, not that kind of bender, more of a binger. There you go. Been up. I've been up late Netflix binging. A little late to the party. This isn't quite a. I guess you can call this a hybrid. I used to do mashup episodes. Remember those? Um, this you can call this a uh, late night thoughts and totally irrelevant media review mashup episode. Yo folks, totally late to the party, but I just finally uh, got myself to watch Narcos with good old poppy of the internet, Pablo, um, and uh, some deep things just start to resonate here. Uh, let me get into it in just a sec. Let's enjoy the rest of this DJ Z track entitled Gravitas Grammatica, a gravity remix live, improvised live to tape performance of digital audio asset packs for your entertainment by your favorite imaginary psychic and literary fictional party DJ, the intergalactic DJ Z. Off the top of my head, totally real, totally raw, totally unscripted episode about my deep thinky thoughts I'm having here uh, in the middle of the night about this show, Narcos. Have you seen it? Na- Narcos, Los Narcos Traficantes, the uh, soap opera. start off with the most uh, burning thought on my mind, friends, as DJZ gently fades away into the distance of the late night uh, mystique. Well, you'll be back, DJZ, don't you sweat it. Um, but boys, uh, friends, gentlemen of the show, none of those mustaches work. And I, I hope that was the design choice. As a critic, as an amateur critic of the media entertainment enterprise, what the F with the facial hair on this show. Now, <laughs> um, I'm usually a, f- a fan of what the F moments. I love asking that to a show like what the F insert name of show I'm watching. You know, like that's one of my favorite moments. Uh, and except for the mustaches, this show actually doesn't do that. There's not a lot of that happening. Um, For those of you who obviously have probably watched it way long ago before uh, I got around to it, you're probably thinking, what the F right now? But here we are. Um, <laughs> Narcos, uh, for those of you who don't know, is about, uh, it, it's, a, it, it's a made for, am I watching this on Netflix? Yes. I don't know if it's made for Netflix, but it's made for Netflix binging 
um, quality production, high level entertainment of seriousness, um, like, uh, inspired by true life events, fictional romp through, uh, wild west, uh, cartel style violence for the sake of violence, but explained in, in the, the real human logistical, uh, logistics of, of real life gritty, you know, facts of life <laughs> kind of way. Uh, let me just be clear. I'm, I'm giving this uh, my endorsement. This is, I'm only on episode nine of season one. And I didn't realize there were more seasons. I thought maybe this was it. Because, um, let me just tell you, right now, I just, I paused at the top of episode nine because the, the, the come full circle aha now i know what's happening um flashback to the beginning of the show which was a flash forward in the moment of its opening um display uh is truly c'est magnifique it's just i stopped and said to myself out loud like that's art right there what i just watched and and uh, i assure you i just binged it straight through from episode one um, on purpose, set you know, set my my evening aside for this purpose. As I've been thinking about it for a while, I've been looking at the the title keeps coming up, and I keep not watching it. I've not watched it since whenever it first debuted. Um, but with all the <laughs> with all the 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 love and um, and fan f- fandom happening uh, around our 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 favorite. Uh, Star Wars um, super villain or whatever he is, uh, <laughs> um, the Pedro Pascal, the Papa Pedro of the internet. I had to, right? Because um, full disclosure, I just watched The Last of Us, all of it, and I did. I didn't do a media review episode. I don't know why. Although I enjoyed it, I didn't have. I just didn't have an episode aha moment. Whereas with this, I did. And I'm not sure why. No, no judgment on the Last of Us, but um, but but put a pin on the corkboard, as I fully intend to come full circle, and do an episode media review on that. It's on the list, and I I certainly had opinions, and I certainly had a lot of a couple of really solid what the f with you moments uh, with that show. But uh, but Narcos. Um, the, the straightforward, self-aware, self-critiquing way in which it fictionalizes this period in American history, one which I lived through, literally, with eyes wide open being a fan of questioning uh, the news and the media from my earliest days of, uh, of uh, arriving here in, in wide-eyed and wild-eyed bewilderment of this Disney-topia of a nation, which I love. Never, never let it be misunderstood. I love... Um, the United States of America and and all of the promise of what it should become. But that's an episode for another day. Pin on the corkboard. Uh, I have to say what this show, Narcos, does in a truly, like, eloquent, straightforward, like, everyone from the left coastiest of the left coast and, and the middle America of of the Red Hats can watch this show and be provoked by it um, and be challenged by it because it's about shit we think we know that we don't know all the facts about. And it, I don't know how accurate or how strictly, you know, true to true events this is or is not what it is achieve what it's, it's great achievement as a piece of film uh, is, 
that it's it's like nearly Shakespearean in its directness, in its expose of the human hubris and and the violence in men's hearts and minds. Um, what is this story but an exploration of where greed and corruption and ego will lead a group of men in particular, uh, men who lust after the intangible, uh, the intangible addictions beyond that of the obvious, right? Like, why is greed? And in a way, it asks this. Um, and it and it challenges the notion of what is good and bad in a way that I cannot disagree with. Although I don't know that anyone could pin me to or pigeonhole me as to where, without allowing me to explain myself, uh, I don't think anyone who doesn't know me already could accurately pigeonhole me as to where I would stand uh, uh, in regards to the moral squishiness that every character is partial to in this series. Um, but what, what I delighted in just now, so much so that I felt it was necessary to stop and do a late night's thought, hopefully not too long, I mean, just a little mini episode. I'm done with those in ages. I'm totally blowing out my vocal cords, so I probably can't talk long anyways. I don't have tea. I don't have coffee. I didn't really set up for this, but here we are, friends. Um, storytelling and theater and film at its best at its purest, as as in its most art form, uh, is a way to challenge viewership, the audience, the reader, the the perceiver of the story, um, in th- theoretical terms that call out the harsh realities of the world we live in. Violence solves nothing. And yet it will be used like a cudgel and tool by those who choose to wield it. And what are we supposed to do? It's the catch-22 of human hubris. It's the catch-22. The, it's one of the oldest and most original of ego traps, this faux dilemma and this show and I'm being quite specific with my words so please don't gloss over them this show I may be attributing too much credit this show for me as a viewer does an exceptionally uh, eloquent beautiful attractive uh, enjoyable thrill ride of a job of giving us a look see into the heart's of evil men without cartoonifying them and allowing us to contemplate and question which one of these men are truly evil and which one of these men are truly good um, amongst those that are positioned and pitted against one another. And we see the spectrum, right? From, from the grace of genuine unblemished innocence and the miracles that sometimes protect that to the gritty, harshest, obtuse realities of choosing to manifest one's will upon the world through any and all means so long as they are not perpetrated back onto oneself, right? Um, and the, the range of visceral emotions that come with that. It's not too cheesy. It's not too campy. It's not too trying to, you know, it's not trying too hard to be the godfather. It's kind of just showing us in, in the most... Uh, neutral of terms. I mean, the guy's almost pedantic. This evil villain 
whom I recall being vilified in the earliest of days. And I remember the moment that, you know, he is finally extradited and whatnot. Not to root, not to spoiler alert, spoiler alert. Um, and I haven't gotten there in the show yet. Like I said, I'm, I'm still, I'm just about, I'm still season one, um, episode nine, but the grand finale of episode eight was just the right level of profound and banal for me. I find gratuitous violence sad and pointless and or potentially part of the problem in our world as we know it today. Given the the almost redundant commonplacedness of daily matazons of our own here, um, it's obscene. That was that something that was once um, strictly limited to the purview of evil men, you know, banditos of the lowest kind and low, uh, of most grotesque order, is now nearly commonplace and occurring amongst the innocent instead of um, between those at war whose hands both are already bloodied. Um, and... I don't know, perhaps it's just my own absurd curiosity that I'm choosing to watch this show. I don't remember, when did it actually first come out? 2017. So it's been a hot minute to be watching this show here and now and to watch two um, tribes of men rely almost exclusively upon the carnage of gun violence to resolve their perceived, imagined, and concrete problems. But there's something that perhaps, um, well, could be triggering, uh, could be hurtful, could be psychologically disruptive, but also, I think, is profoundly resonant here and now. Um, the, dis- the, the points in which the show literally through its narrative. And I'm always wary of a narrator voice. And when it works, I am its, you know, most profoundest fan. But often it's, it, it, it fails uh, to, to, a narrator can, can, the narration device can utterly fail and has been, you know, a, for a serial television show, um, it's just dicey. Uh, but I must say that in this case, it's succeeded to um, engage and fascinate a- and and has allowed me the opportunity to sort of um, recognize that it is indeed attempting to engage the audience in wrestling with the moral questions which could often just be glossed over and or neglected entirely uh, unrecognized um, because of the overwhelming power of the glamorization of violence, even when it's done, you know, uh, knowingly. Uh, That discussion at the very end, which opens the show and, you know, both visually and thematically, brings us to a really intense full circle moment. This discussion of the relative nature of good and bad and the the ways in which we have become accustomed to differentiate them is, I think, profound. Because in my opinion... It is this very dichotomy, this relationship, this relativistic yin and yang that we that we must question and reinvestigate as this echo chamber of argumentation continues to fail to render true peace. And 
the problematic issue of Cain killing Abel and Abel getting revenge and or I need to I need to pick a name. I for, I always forget Abel's wife's name. Um he had a wife mysteriously they both did. But I digress. You see the point. Like uh the um, the di- the, the, the seemingly impossible to solve dichotomous catch 22 problem of an eye for an eye and the just revenge the there is there is a line somewhere in there about and it reads better in spanish than it does in english and it's I, I wouldn't have gone with the particular translation that they went with for the embedded subtitles. But uh, the rev- the revenge that is just is what is being communicated by this line that I'm thinking of, which I yet I cannot quote. The a just a just retort, to use a different term, um, uh, you know, a justified revenge taking. oldest ego trap in the human drama that we justify the taking of a life for the taking of a life for the taking of a life. Because that turns into a round robin of bloodletting that can go on ad nauseum until extinction should it be the law. And yet there is a seductiveness in the end of that episode. The the star of the show, the main DEA agent, the primary character, the the the, the shining knight, the white knight of salvation, the occupier, the the capitalist, the, uh, the all the labels right that he represents. He's also sort of just the everyman, the guy that didn't know what he was getting himself into when he took on the job, the guy who feels he's just answering the call of duty, not to inadvertently reference my favorite game in the world. Um, I am totally like, I just love that fucking video game, but that's a whole nother issue for a whole nother episode, but it's been on the corkboard. Um, he's there with his loved ones, his family his wife, his, the, the newly adopted child, which at first we presumed was their own, and now we know was brought to them as an innocent in the carnage, you know, uh, nearly lost amongst the endless taking of sacrificial soldiers. Um, and he says something to the effect of, you know, call me a bad guy if you want, but if you can't tell the difference, you haven't met enough bad guys. I get it, right? Like, it is not lost on me. There's a, there's a resonance, there's a theme, there's a meme that's been going around, um, and I'm going to paraphrase it badly and turn it into my own statement because I, I don't have it in front of me. I didn't plan this, but it's some, I've seen it several times in the past week for obvious reasons. Um, and it's being used in multiple ways. So don't presume or prejudge what you think I'm trying to say with it because I'm not. I'm quoting it or referencing it um, for awareness. And then, I, you know, just so that you know what I'm talking about. Something about, and I don't have it in front of me, Something about a rock in the hand killed Abel. A rock in the hand killed Goliath. Now there's inferred righteousness and inferred evil embedded in the meme, obviously. It's a biblical reference. It's a pair of biblical references. Um... 
one which I've already broached in this episode, Cain killing Abel. Uh, and obviously the second one being David killing Goliath. The underdog versus the evil tyranny of a giant monster man. The Catch-22, the ego trap, the seductive honeypot of murder death is that no bad guy believes themselves to be Cain. No villain sees themselves as Goliath in reality. In my mind, in my opinion, I could be wrong. Perhaps there is some sick, cynical son of a bitch out there in the world that that does. There's always an exception. No, no absolutist statement is ever absolutely true, uh, as I like to remind the world. But um, but let us say, for the sake of saying, that it is rare enough. The tyranny of bloodletting is that it becomes irrelevant who thinks themselves the good guy and who believes themselves the villain if the round robin of an eye for an eye proceeds so garishly that the world is rendered both blind and drowning in the blood of its own hubris. The distinction becomes meaningless. One can obfuscate and mitigate the delineation of yin and yang so much that it becomes unascertainable, undiscernible. Now, I will seem to make myself a hypocrite here. One cannot separate up from down. They are not two different things in opposition. And this is one of the key mysteries and open secrets of the world we live in, of the universe that has rendered us into existence. One of the other bigger, more scarier ones is that the universe itself is alive. But that's, again, an issue for another episode. Pin on the corkboard, please. We cannot separate up from down, left from right, light from dark. They are inseparable because they are co-creative. They are mutually co-evocative. They render one another in relationship to their relationship to each other. That's, uh, we could say we are unpacking that from one of the statements there, whether it was intended or it was created by the interaction of author, creation, artists, and uh, and audience. He says the thing about good and bad. He says something to the effect, the main character, narrate, the narrator, in this moment of full circleness and of, of you know, the, the, the crazy, calamitous... Uh, chaotic, hypocritical, faux ending of of you know the the rendering of an unjust justice as uh, as the main villain uh, pretends play acts at turning himself into some sort of um, repercussions you know in his self constructed to you know it's being whisked away to his to his self uh, designed prison. Um, I mean, the fact that this happened in reality, which it did, right? Everyone remembers the mysterious tunnel under the bathtub. How do you think that happened? He and his own people built the place. Duh. Um, uh, <laughs> the absurdity. I, one of the things I was quite uh, at first reluctant and sort of mm, suspicious of was the fact that this show opens with um, an interesting reference to... Uh, what is it? Sur- magical surrealism or mad? Uh, ah, I forget what it is. Now I need to go look. Let's pop the first episode on real quick. Um, it, there it is. No, don't no, mute the thing. I don't want to get sued. Muting. How do I mute it? Oh, okay. Uh, this is a great dis- disclaimer, by the way. Uh, that that opens the show. 
This television series is inspired by true events. Some of the characters, names, businesses, incidents, and certain locations and events have been fictionalized for dramatization purposes. Any similarity to the name, character, or history of any person is entirely coincidental and unintentional. Meanwhile, they literally also use actual archival footage of real life events. Uh, but the thi- the, that's not the thing I was referencing. The, the next, the thing that the show actually opens with, after the disclaimer, is, and we're rolling here. And I quote, magical realism. I like to call it magical surrealism, but I guess I'm just adding the surreal out of force of habit. Magical realism is defined as what happens when a highly detailed, realistic setting is invaded by something too strange to believe. Uh, And when I saw that, it was the farthest thing from my expectations and was quite the what the F moment. It's one of the few that I've had in, with this show. And and usually I welcome those quite warmly, right? It's like, what the, what? What is going on? I love it. Um, and then, we, you know, the show drops into what it drops into. And I was, and it's a really beautiful thing that they do with the graphic. And then they do that thing where some of the letters turn red for whatever reason. Um, and, you know, it comes full circle at the end. And, uh, and the main villain speak something to it. He says something different, but similar. When are lies necessary? But if, if not, when, and I'm butchering the reference, I don't have it in front of me. When, you know, when is a lie necessary? When the truth is too terrible to bear or something to that effect, uh, or too strange to understand, maybe something along those lines. This Rumination, this contemplation, this exploration of good and evil and its relativity and its complicity with the machinations of criminal organizations, world governments, and the invisible hand of fate, whatever that may be, is quite transcendent. It it surpasses itself. It is greater than the sum of its parts, this show, I think. Now, I haven't finished watching the rest of it, and I don't know how many more... There's three seasons, apparently. So I may have different things to say in the not-too-distant future, but as of right now, I say to this show, bravo, bravo, bravo. Um... A challenging enough contemplation of the moral relativism of our postmodern uh, world and its corruption and its addictions and its hypocrisies and its sheer carnage always the questions remain. Uh, you know, beyond the the woe is me's of the pain and the grief, and, and and the mockery of such things, there is resoundingly the silence that remains of whatever is there to be done, right? Like when we ask that, humanity tends to stand silent, and we wonder. And we wonder. And that's why I invite you humbly, folks, to, uh, if you are new to the show, to take a deep dive into some of the earlier episodes from way back in the early days. Real rough and raw around the edges, radically unscripted, but dare I say it, about answering that unanswerable question. What can be done beyond Violence upon violence upon violence until we hope one day it has been enough violence, right? Because that's what the cowboy with the white hat does in America. Shoots all the bad guys. But from Cain and Abel through Shakespeare and beyond, if there is any lesson we have learned is that violence begets more violence and never peace. 
and that as a tool, it may get the wielder of it what they want, but that satisfaction is not only ephemeral, illusory, it is severely temporary, and solutions are nary to be found. Nothing is solved at the end of this. Nothing, right? Nothing is solved at the, at the end of episode 8. I don't know what's going to happen episode 9 and 10. And I'm, of course, intrigued to see what happens with the other three episodes. But uh, th- rather, the other the next th- the other two seasons. There's apparently three seasons. Uh, and there's apparently a second show called Narcos Mexico, which I may or may not indulge in watching. Um, there's a whole other... Uh, there's I could do a whole episode of media content review about um, my relationship with different things there uh, in terms of uh, Latin American media, um, which some people would encourage me to do, but others would discourage me from going uh, there. And for reasons that are not what you may presume, Um, (laughs) because I am not what I appear to be on the surface uh, because most people project a bunch of nonsense on me. But one thing I am is a foreigner to these here United States of America. And, uh, although I sound and can, uh, mimic, uh, quite an interesting array of dialects from these here United States, um, they are not my home. They, I mean, they are not my place of origin. They are my home. Um, what we lo- what I would love to see is where is if I can poke a little poke of critique, where's narcos Americanos way? Like no manches, no mames, mijo. Because you know who brings the most American drugs into America through the southern border? Americans. But that's a subject for another day. Ooh, and stay tuned, friends, because as you may have already heard, the breaking news from earlier today was epic and literally unprecedented in its historic historicalness. Um, And of course that is a pun and a joke, but um, I myself am questioning why I did not do a good morning Trumptopia episode. The moment I saw the news, I think I still had to just process it. Um, But here we are. Uh, And uh, having said all that, I will thank you for tuning in. This has been a late night thoughts crossover totally irrelevant media review if you've never seen narcos the original with oh papi of the internet um pedro infante no pedro pascal pedro infante is a singer and but that's the name stuck in my head that always come wants to come out first because it's been around in my head for a lot longer than pedro pascal's name so that's why i always hiccup and hesitate when i try to say pedro pascal's name uh i'm a fan by the way i'm i'm really enjoying his work I'll have to do an episode about The Last of Us. Tune in for that at some point or another. Uh, But I've got some things to say that may or may not be popular about the Mandalorian show. Papi Pedro, what the F? With the helmets and the Mandalorian madness. But that's nonsense for another episode. DJ Zed, play us out. I've said what i got to say about Narcos for now. Put a pin on the corkboard as I'm sure I'll have something else to say in greater detail in the not too distant future about it and all the other shows on my list of lists that I have not gotten to because I've been dragging my feet for reasons that you shall not judge me for. Mostly I've got family in town for an extended stay and I've not been able to spend as much time on any of the content creation projects that I usually am grinding on the daily. If you're curious about that, please head on over to solo.to forward slash Mr. Zeppo and check out all the many dimensions of the Zeppoverse. Thank you. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, and good night to you. This is the end of the episode. Peace out.
oh snap, dude. I just saw that there's another whole series from 2012 about the same dude. That's just called his name Escobar. This, I wonder, I, one of the questions I didn't talk about just then during the flow, I to, the moment that triggered me was like, so you know, the, remember the scene where he's about to meet with the guy that, that brings him the paper to sign and he gets in the helicopter and flies away to the jail that he built for himself? And he's talking to his mom or his aunt or whatever her relationship is. And I kept, I because I am a native Spanish speaker, for those of you who do not know, I am a native Spanish speaker. Your beautiful English is not my native language. I had to learn it. Um, I'm a native Spanish speaker in real life, uh, for reals. Um, and uh, this whole show, I've been tickled pink at some of the weird nuances of how different Colombian Spanish is from my version of Spanish. And uh, and uh, when the when the grandma was talking, I'm like, is she a native Colombian? Is that what Colombians really sound like? Or are these are like, are these like second, third generation Latinx Americans? Uh, that have a lot of American in them, and the, and it's like not the same because it's not the same, right? Like when you go to a country and you listen to natives who've never left speak a language, it's a little different sounding than when you hear a second, third generation, um, you know, descendant of native speakers who still who they may or you know who still speak the language. It's just different. Um, and even happens in the first generation. Like I'm native, I'm a native born Spanish speaker and my Spanish is for shit. Like I would, I would have to play Americans in Latin American television. Right. Um, <laughs> cause, cause no one would believe my accent anymore. Uh, and I was having one of those moments that I was just, it was not a critique. It's not that bad, but it, but as a, the ear doesn't ever lose it. My tongue has lost it. Like I don't sound like a native Spanish speaker to native Spanish speakers from my home country. Uh, with a little practice, I do here in the States. But uh, I was giggling about that, and that's what made me stop and do the show. Uh, but wow, this other show, I just saw it as I was scrolling around under the, you know, show, shows like this, uh, under the Narcos collection, because I was debating whether or not I was going to watch Narcos Mexico. Because this is, this is the thing, I, another thing I didn't say. Usually, like, when I was a kid in Mexico and vis revisiting Mexico after moving away, like, Mexican television would drive me up the wall. I just don't like the way they talk in television. They have this weird television sound that's different to me than any of the, like, family and friends that I know from living there and from visiting there. It just sounds weirdly different. And it's like... It, it goes back to when, you know, television and film industry there came to be. And it's like a whole radio thing. And, you know, t television announcers in every country sound a little different. Although, except for the ones that purposefully try not to. But anyways. Um, so, yeah. I was wondering, like, is this, are, is this like, like the, the legit hardcore Colombian sound or, or not? Anyways, I'm now debating whether or not I want to watch this other... Uh, Escobar, El Patron del Mal. See, my Spanish is terrible. Um, cause I'm gonna I'm gonna bookmark it. It's I just added it to my list. Cause if it's like legit, it, this looks like it might have been like a uh, like authentic home country production. And I was wondering about that too this whole time during uh, uh, Narcos with our with our um, delightful Pedro Pascal and. Wagner Maura. I kept wondering, like, how many generations, like, are they first generation, second generation, third generation Lat Latinos? I don't know, right? Um, are they native born Latinos? Do they are, are they native born Latinos who, like me, have lost some of that raw authenticity in their accent? Like, what is it? Like, which which way is it working out to be? Uh, and so now I'm curious if that other episode is like produced there. Uh, at some point, I asked myself. Whoever produced Narcos, did they hire all the actors here and then go over there to film it? Or did they go over there and hire a bunch of local talent? Like, I don't know. Uh, I do not know the answer to these things. But I should stop rambling now because that was supposed to be the end of the episode a while ago.